Hey, grade 12s, we are continuing our calculus um, study here when we are on part C of our questions here. We've already gone through A and B, and we're busy discovering different types and ways of asking us calculus graphs, cubic graphs, which will be for about 15 marks in your exams. We've done one already, and here is your second question that I'll be working through with you. And it says, given that fx is equal to x minus 1 all squared, times x plus 3, okay? Determine the turning points of f. Before we get into the 2a question, x minus 2, all squared, and x plus 3 is telling us our x-intercepts. And because x minus 1 squared is appearing twice, ultimately, at 1, we'll have a turning point. x minus 3 is also going to be, or x equals minus 3 is also going to be an x-intercept. Okay, but let's get into the question, determine the turning points of f. Before we'd have to get into the, into the question, we'd have to first times this out. Okay, so x minus 1 all squared would be what? x squared minus x minus x, so it's minus 2x, and plus 1, and then times by the x plus 3. So if we now times by the x plus 3, we're going to have x cubed, right, minus 2x squared plus x, and then plus 3x squared minus 6x plus 3. Okay, I've, I've, succe I've successfully times that x plus 3 into the bracket. Let's just check. x times x squared is x cubed minus 2x squared plus x plus 3x squared minus 6x plus 3. Great. Now let's just clean it up. x cubed minus 2x squared plus 3x squared is plus x squared plus x minus 6x is minus 5x, and plus 3. Great. In order to find the turning points, remember, we need to first of all find the first derivative. We don't need to use first principles. We can simply use our shortcut. So look how quickly it takes me. We can simply go the 3 times to the front, and then reduce the 3 by 1 to give us 2. So 2 times to the front, reduce the 2 by 1, gives me 2x, right? That x falls away, minus 5, and obviously the 3 has nothing to do with the first derivative. Right, at the turning point, the first derivative will always equal 0. That's because if we have a turning point, the gradient of the tangent at that point is totally flat, meaning the gradient is 0. So we can make the first derivative equal to naught. So naught is equal to 3x squared plus 2x minus 5. So we can factorize that into 3x and an x. We need to put the 5 in somehow. 5, 1, 5, 1, how? 5 over there, 1 over there. We need to put the signs in carefully as well. We're going to go plus over there and minus over there. Okay, so the two uh, coordinates, the x coordinates for the turning points would be what? x equals negative 5 over 3 or x equals... 1. Okay, so once again, just like I did in my last video, I suggest that you could do something like this. We are going to say, where is our cubic graph? Over there. x cubed plus x squared minus 5x plus 3. So I'm going to literally say, bracket bracket cubed plus bracket bracket squared minus 5 bracket bracket plus 3. Okay, now let's substitute in. Firstly, we have to substitute in negative 5 over 3. We're going to do that three times, negative 5 over 3, and negative 5 over 3. So that's now going to give us 256 over 27, or 9,48, if you prefer. So the y here, therefore y is, let's go 9,48, and when x is 1, we should know what this is going to be, but let's do it anyway, right? Let's delete all this, and we're going to substitute rather a 1. And a 1, and one more 1, 1, and we are indeed going to get naught. That should not take you by surprise, because we saw that one of the x-intercepts was going to be at 1. So there are our two turning points. I'm just going to write on the right. Turning point 1 would have been negative 5 over 3 and 9, 48. Right? And the second turning point is going to be 1 and naught. Remember, you can have a local maximum and a local minimum for your turning points, depending on where those two turning points are positioned.
Okay, so we've successfully worked out our two turning points. Part B says draw a neat sketch, show the turning points and the intercepts. Okay, so because our original uh, function was factorized for us, we know that the x-intercepts are going to be at 1 and at negative 3. So we can go my page up a little bit here. Okay, so we're going to go to 1 and we're going to go to negative 1, 2, 3. They usually give you graph paper, so you don't have to worry about it being too fancy. So there are x-intercepts. Our turning points were at 1 and 0, so we've got our turning point already. And at negative 5 over 3, which is what? Not quite, not quite 2, hey, negative 2. It's negative 1 and 2 thirds. So there's negative 1, there's negative 2. So we're somewhere over there, and we're up at 9, comma 4, 8. So let's just say that's over there. Okay, there's the other turning point. So we know now everything except the y-intercept. So to find the y-intercept, make x equal to naught. So here was our equation. Blah, 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 blah. So if we make all those x's naught, what are we left with? 3. So 3 is going to be our y-intercept, which let's say is over there. Okay. Now we're ready to go up and up and up. We're going to turn over there. We're going to cut at 3. We're going to go there. We're going to turn over there. And we're going to go back up. A similar shape to our previous exercise. We should, should just label it because our graph paper was pretty um, roughly drawn. So there's our one turning point. There is our another x-axis, what uh, x-intercept, what was it again? It was negative 3 and naught. There is a turning point, which was negative 5 over 3 and 9, comma 4, 8. And there was a y-intercept, which was naught and 3. And then we could just write f of x. Okay, happy. Right, number C says the following. Determine the coordinates of the point where the concavity changes. Okay. So concavity, you remember, talks about how and where the tangents are positioned on our cubic graph. So the tangents you'll see are all above the graph there and above there. But at some point here, right in the middle between our two turning points, the concavity will change and your tangents will now start appearing below the function and below the function. So now what, where exactly do the tangents decide to flip over, okay? That comes down to the second derivative. So the first derivative, let's just write it here. The first derivative we had earlier was 3x squared plus 2x minus 5. The point of concavity is where the second derivative is equal to 0. So the second derivative is, first, is just the first derivative derived again. So what will the second derivative be? 6x plus 2. So now... We make it equal to naught, 6x plus 2. And what will the x value be at the point of where the concavity changes? Negative 2 over 6, so negative a third, right? And we want the whole coordinate, so we would have to sub in f of negative a third into, the, into our cubic graph. So I'm just going to edit what I've got on my screen here. And we're going to replace this all with negative a thirds. One more, negative a third, there we go. And we're going to get 128 over 27, which is 4, 74, 4, 74. So there is our point of inflection, or where the concavity changes, negative 1 over 3, and 4, 74. Okay, an alternative way of doing it is that it lies between the two turning points. So if my turning points are at negative 5 over 3 and at 1, the distance between those, in other words, almost the midpoint between those two x values would have been negative 1 over 3. Okay. And then you would have subbed it back into the original function and got the y part of that coordinate. Okay. So there is the coordinate where the concavity changes. Okay. On to letter D now is where we just got to think a little bit more. And it says the following for us. Determine the values of k for which fx equals k has three distinct roots. Okay, very good question here. If you look carefully, the roots describe the x-intercepts of our cubic function. At the moment, we've got 1, 2. 
x-intercept and roots. In order to get three distinct roots, we would need to shift this cubic graph how? Up, down. What do you think? We need to shift it down. If we shift it down, we're going to have this intercept there. And this intercept here is going to form two intercepts there. And we're going to shift down and shift down and shift down. But at some point, that uh, turning point is going to hit over there. At which, at which stage, we'd only then have one and then two to, uh, roots. Eh? So we can't just shift it down forever. We have to shift it down be to, between a certain interval. So how do we work out that interval? It's all got to do with that y value of 9,48 or whatever it was as an improper fraction. Um, I think it was 120, no, 9,48 was 257, 256 over 27. Um, it's just right there. 9,48 was 256 over 27, if you wanted to use that rather. Okay, so if we say fx is equal to k, remember fx was our function name, so we could almost say that 3x squared, uh, no, where's our function? Our function was, sorry, fx equals x cubed plus x squared minus 5x plus 3. That was our function. So now if it's going to equal k, because fx is going to equal k, we can say k is equal to x cubed plus x squared minus 5x plus 3. Now, what I'm trying to show you, show you here is that now if you join and move that k onto the side of the cubic graph, it's going to create a minus, right? You're going to have 0 is equal to x cubed plus, 3x, uh, plus x squared minus 5x plus 3 minus k. So that k value is going to be negative when I take it to the side of my function. In other words, when I now answer my question, and I can say that k can move from what? It can move 0 up until how much? I need not say it must go negative, right? It doesn't have to be negative. It can simply be 256 over 27. Or if you'd rather have it as, how did we say it? We had it as 9,48, right? In other words, if k can go up to 9,48, when I put it over here, it's going to be the negative 9,48, which would imply that the graph would then move down. Okay, if your answer had a negative in your answer there, it would mean that a negative and a negative would have made a plus, which would not have moved my graph down. It would move it up. Okay, so be careful there. Make sure that you choose the correct signs. It is positive 9,48 or 256 over 27 if you'd prefer to have it that way. Okay, the last question for this, for this task here is letter E, which says the following. Determine the equation of the tangent 2f that is parallel to y is equal to negative 5x, if x is negative. Okay, so first of all, if we have parallel lines, negative 5 there is simply going to be the gradient of the tangent that we're looking for. Okay, so what gives us the gradient of the tangent? The first derivative. So the first derivative from our page before here our first derivative was 3x squared plus 2x minus 5. That was our, our first derivative formula. So now, if the first derivative gives me the gradient of the tangent, but we know the gradient of the tangent is negative 5, we can therefore say negative 5 is equal to 3x squared plus 2x minus 5. Does that make sense? Because we know the gradient we can substitute it there as the first derivative. Now what we do is we simply solve for x now, take the negative 5 across, and we're going to have 3x squared plus 2x. The negative 5s are gone. At this point, we take out an x, and we're going to have 3x left plus 2. So what are the x values? x is equal to naught, or x is equal to negative 2 over 3. And the question said, determine the equation of the tangent to f, that is parallel if x is smaller than naught. So that now rules out that 
part of the, the answer, and we're going to take this part forward. So that means at x of negative 2 over 3, the gradient of the tangent would have been negative 5. So all we need to do now is find what the y value is at when x is equal to negative 2 over 3. So f of negative 2 over 3 equals, let's sub in negative 2 over 3 back into our original f function, which is still on my screen. So I've got negative 5 over 3 at the moment, so I'm just going to delete the 5s and change them into 2s. There's 5 going into a 2. And there's the last one. And I'm going to get 175 over 27, which is once again a horrible fraction over 27. Or if you chose to use, you could say 6,48. Okay, that means now we need to find y is equal to mx plus c. Okay, by the way, what coordinate did we find over here? Negative 2 over 3. And uh, let's stick with fractions. 175 over 27. That is the position where the tangent is touching the f graph and forms a gradient of negative 5. Okay, so lastly, we need to say, okay, our gradient that we have here is negative 5. Our x value where this is happening is negative 2 over 3. We're subbing this in, and 175 over 27. And then our c value is our last piece of the unknown. Remember, you can also say y minus y1 is equal to m x minus x1. Same, same. Okay. Then lastly, let's times out this bracket. You've got negative 5 times negative 2 over 3. That's going to give you what? Positive 10 over 3. And that's 175 over 27 plus c. So then c ends up being what? 175 over 27 minus 10 over 3 making C 85 over 27. Therefore, what is the equation of our tangent? Y is equal to negative 5x plus 85 over 27. Okay, so the last few marks of this question, a little bit more challenging. Hopefully my explanation made sense to you. In the next video, I'll be speaking about optimization or maximization questions for calculus. Usually the last six or seven marks of your calculus question.